Thanks very much, Chiffon. Um, hi, Kendra. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Chiffon. <laughs> um, I'm just going to get started with the presentation here today. As you know, my name is Marnie Baudouin, and I'm a consultant here at ISLI, the Institute for Innovation and Second Language Education. I'm going to be talking to you today about the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, and I'm also going to be talking to you about the European Languages Portfolio, which is, which is linked to the framework, also known as the CEFR. Well, as Chiffon explained, I'm going to be asking you to try and use those text boxes, but just right for right now on this slide, I'm just going to ask you to grab a, a regular old-fashioned pencil and pe or pen and a piece of paper, and I would just invite you to think for a minute about what languages do you know, make a little list, like English, French, Japanese, whichever those languages are. And then what would be a couple of words or phrases that you would use to describe how well you can use each language? So I'm going to give you a moment, a few moments to think about that and to jot down your responses. Go ahead. Okay, now I'm going to invite you to either use your microphone or to use this uh, plain slide that you see in front of you and use the text box. I'm not going to ask you, you know, which languages you feel that you have proficiency in. I'm just going to ask you to jot down or use your mic to share those words or phrases that you use to describe your level of proficiency in languages, you know, such as intermediate or basic, those kinds of words. Go ahead, let's, let's just start sharing here. Okay, well, I'll go, because um, I don't know if you want us talking or not. Um, I used fluent, um, sorry, Marnie, I didn't use intermediate, beginner, advanced, although my French, I think, is intermediate. Um, but I said not fluent, but could get by in any situation, and everything else was more of a, um, a couple words here or there to either ask, do you speak English, please, thank you, how to order certain beverages at certain places, but that's what I've got. Hi, and then I actually didn't use very basic, I used, like, I can use it in everyday conversations about my daily life, or I can use it to find out information from others. That's great. Thank you very much. Those are some really good examples of, of how people describe their language proficiency. And we hear, um, when I do this particular exercise with teachers, you hear all kinds of, of words and phrases that are used to describe how they're able to use and function in the different languages they know. The inherent problem with how we have traditionally um, described our language proficiency to others is that we don't really have any kind of shared understanding around what we mean by these words and phrases. For example, if you take very basic or you take the word fluent. If I were to say somebody, I'm fluent in French, that might mean something very different to them than it means to me. If I say I have, you know, a basic usage of um, Japanese, to somebody else, that might mean, oh, you're able to function and, and use, you know, that you're able to have some conversations, whereas I'm thinking, well, no, I only know five to ten words in Japanese. It also doesn't give us a lot of really good information about what types of language skills we're actually able to use in the language. Um, we don't know whether we're talking about, are we talking about oral language? Are we talking about written language? Are we talking about reading? Are we talking about um, spontaneous conversations with others? We just don't know. So that leads us to the need for some way to describe how we are able to function in a variety of languages. And, and this is where we get the Common European Framework of Reference. This is where the CEFR comes in. Now, just a little tiny bit of brief background to this document. The CEFR. Uh, was developed about 10 years ago by the Council of Europe. And the reason it was developed was because the European Union was becoming the European Union, 
and there was going to be a great deal of mobility from country to country, and therefore people would be, you know, trained in different types of professions and trades, and they would be moving to different places uh, within the European Union with greater ease than they had ever had before. And any kind of language certification, for example, that they may have from their, their country of origin would not mean anything necessarily in the country where they were trying to seek employment. So the CEFR was actually developed for vocational and economic purposes. Now I believe that um, you both have, maybe you could just indicate with a little check mark, uh, just a poll, uh, you both have a copy of the CEFR that was sent to you um, for use during the session. Kendra, you have it. Great. Miriam, do you have a copy of the CEFR as well? Great. Super. So why don't we just take a look at that? Now, as you can see, this is just about, I'm, I'm very glad that you have your own copy because this is just about no help whatsoever <laughs> to be able to look at this. So I'm going to ask you to look at your very own copies. And I wonder if you could just use the mic or you can use the um, chat box to share some of your observations about what, you know, what are some of the qualities of this particular document. And I'll start you off. I'll start you off with something. Um, what I notice, so I'll start the phrasing, what I notice about the CEFR is that it is broken down into different language skills. I see reading, writing, spoken production, spoken interaction, and listening. Okay, whenever either of you are ready, please go ahead. Um, it goes from easy to really, really hard. Almost really, really hard at the C2 level that seems even I possibly can't do in my native language. And it's very outcomes oriented, what you can do. They have I can, blah, blah. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of the I can's are simple examples. Um, so for underwriting, it says a short, simple postcard, sending holiday greetings, personal details, so entering my name on the form, some basic stuff, familiar names, words, simple sentences. Um, but it kind of gives something, it kind of gives you some concrete examples, I guess, that, that you can look at and go, okay, yes, I can do that, versus I can write a simple phrase, well, about what? How simple is it? How hard is it? And I guess, as Marnie was saying, what are the definitions that everybody else has? Those are terrific observations. You're, you're all absolutely right. It does go from A1, A2, which are considered basic user, to B1, B2, which are considered independent user, to C1, C2, which is considered level of uh, a proficient user. And Miriam, I think you're very correct in that you know, some of that C2, uh, some of those C2 levels, and you said, I'm not even sure I can do that in my own language. There's probably a lot of people who would say that very same thing. If you look at writing, for example, in C2, this is a, this is a very advanced level. And it's because it is task-based. Really, unless you are doing those tasks in your life or in your work, um, you won't have need to actually be at that level. So it's very possible that lots of people are not operating at the C1 or C2 level in one of these skills, uh, even in their own native language or their own language of origin. Um, you're absolutely correct that it's self-reflective. It begins with the I can statements. It is for the user, it's for the language learner to be able to describe their very own language proficiency. It is based on what you can do, so it's proficiency based, it's not deficiency based. It doesn't matter what you can't do. This framework is only interested in what you can do. It moves in a progression from A1 to C2. But it is also recursive. Um, if I am operating, say, for example, at a C1 level uh, in English, all the way up and down in all, of those, in all of those skills, it doesn't mean that I never stop doing A1 tasks. I will always do A1 tasks. I will always be engaged in using language in very, very simple ways. So you will be operating at any, any given time throughout the framework. It is meant to be very simply written, 
so that a variety of people at different ages, uh, different proficiency levels, uh, it's been validated for many, many languages in many different countries. And the, the examples are concrete. It doesn't mean that you see, for example, in writing that I can write something simple, such as a postcard, but you're limited to those text forms. It just means that this is the type of text form that one might find at this particular level. The CEFR that you see here is just the one uh, global overall framework. There's an entire book for CEFR that scales within scales within scales. It's, uh, it's a pretty amazing document. But let's look at what we as language educators working with uh, most of our students, if we're working with a 9Y program or working with a 3Y program, we're going to be most interested in the A1, A2, and B1 levels. Okay, we're going to be interested in these particular levels. I'm just going to backtrack here for one second. You'll notice the B2 level um, is the B2 level is actually considered the international uh, standard for the world of work. So that if you are at a B2, a pretty solid B2 level, and actually most people are not exactly at the same level in all of those language skills, but B2 is considered uh, the level for uh, employment internationally. So if you're at a B2 level, you probably have the appropriate language skills to work in just about any workplace in that particular language, barring really specific um, technical language, for example. But let's take a look at the first three levels, just listening and reading. This is just a quick screen capture. And I would like to hear from you again. <laughs> I'd like to hear from you again about what are some of the words that you see um, that help you understand these levels better? What are some of the words or phrases that are used within the descriptors of A1, A2, B1 that kind of jump out at you as being repeated or they seem to be keywords or phrases that indicate the type of language that is used at this level? Anytime you are ready. If there's familiar, you can understand familiar words, familiar names, high frequency vocabulary, simple. Um, I was going to say as well, simple and familiar, and also when it's spoken slowly and clearly, uh, short, simple, personal things. So it's all things that you are already aware of, um, and it's all things that are done short, clear, slowly and clearly, slow and clear. It's none of it's at regular pace, I guess, fluent, regular, proficient pace. Yeah, we can see at the A1 level that everything that is done at the A1 level, and we would see this as consistent with um, any of our beginner levels. Um, for instance, if you were teaching FSL in a nine-year program, your students starting out in grades four, grade five would be at this A1 level. And everything is very basic, very familiar. Um, the learner is supported by others who are speaking very slowly and clearly. Um, you're using visuals to help you understand. And even as you move up to A2, you still have high frequency vocabulary. Everything is still of a familiar context in terms of your immediate personal rele um, relevance. The language is going to be basic. It's going to be short. It's going to be clear. It's going to be predictable. And when you start getting into B1, you see the context of communication starts to widen. This mimics a little bit how what we see in our curricula, for example. And it's interesting, um, one of you said, well, it's not really a level of fluency. But remember that all of these are a description of a level of proficiency. So rather than thinking of there's one standard for what is fluent language use or what is proficient language use, we understand that there are several levels of language proficiency um, that exist for different language skills. And it's just a matter of describing those levels of language proficiency as accurately and as clearly as possible. 
So by the end of, let's say, um, A2, if I said I had accomplished an A2 level, it really means that I'm starting to move on to B1. And you can see that this document here is presented in a linear fashion. Um, almost, it looks, some people call it a rubric. It's not a rubric, but it looks, you know, it's, it's because it's in a grid. Um, it actually would probably be best represented in something that's almost cone shape with the A1 level being at the point and the C2 level being at the widest part of the cone. Because as you progress through those levels, um, you it increases in terms of context, it increases in terms of language complexity. So it takes time to go through each one of these levels, but generally if you're on, a, on an average learning continuum, it will take you less time to get through an A1 level than it will to get through B1 level, for example. And each one of these levels can take years, absolutely. Unless you're in a very accelerated sort of program or you happen to be a really excellent language learner, it will probably, a very quick language learner, it will probably take you years to get through any of these levels. So now I'll invite you to do this exercise again. You have your CEFR in front of you. And earlier I asked you to try and describe your language proficiency using some words and phrases to describe it. I'm going to give you a couple of moments to think about the same thing, do the same exercise, only this time with those same languages. Use the CEFR to help you so you can circle things on your, on your grid, for example. Go ahead. Can I just say I'm a mixture of B2 and B1? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Miriam. Um, what I'll invite you to do now is, is you can, you, you don't have to share your level if you, if you don't want to, but what, I, what I'm really interested in knowing is how were those two experiences different for you? From thinking about your language proficiency and having to describe it with your own words and phrases to the exercise of briefly using the CEFR to think about your language proficiency level. What was the difference between those two experiences? I wonder if you would be able to share that. I'm not sure if it's what you're looking for, Marnie, but I know for French, I had a very a much easier time doing it because I'm very aware of what I can do in French and I'm aware of the CEFR because it's been used um, like in university classes where I'm trying to learn it. Whereas English, I look at it and I'm like, well, I'm kind of a C1, but then I'm kind of a C2, but then here I'm back to C1 or maybe I'm a B2. And I think it's because we don't think about our proficiency in English because it's so natural for us that it was almost slightly harder to place myself on that grid. Miriam, how did you find the experience? Well, it's a lot more detailed. So as opposed to me thinking, oh, what's my language proficiency? And I'm like, you have to struggle to come up with some situations. But here, you can just kind of read each explanation and say, yes, this is me, this is not me, this is me, this is not me. And there's a lot more to choose from. So it is a lot more, I guess it's a lot more detailed and can give, I guess that's why they made it for employers, can give a clearer picture of what the person may or may not be able to do. This is when we do this exercise with teachers in face-to-face in -face sessions as well. This is roughly what uh, people come up with is that it tends to be the, the CEFR is more detailed um, than how people would describe their language proficiency if they're just left to their own devices. Um, that it, it's like a little word picture of what captures a little snapshot of what their language proficiency is. A lot of people say that, well, I didn't really talk about reading and writing, and it's here in the CEFR, so I had to address that level. And I think what you're saying too, Kendra, about, well, I'm not really sure in English because a lot of people don't even think about their language proficiency in their own mother tongue. They think, oh, well, it's my mother tongue, therefore I can do it really well, I can do everything. Uh, when in fact, a lot of us don't do everything in our own mother tongue. A lot of us function, uh, you know, at a personal level using language, but we we may not function at, say, for instance, a C2 level in the in the written capacity in our mother tongue. I mean, if you're not writing 
uh, you know, ministerial reports, if you're not writing briefs, if you're not doing that kind of level of writing, then no, you probably wouldn't be at a C2 level in your own mother tongue. You don't know until you actually do those tasks. The, these are called can-do statements. All of the statements that begin with I can are described as can-do statements. And they really are can-do statements. They're not I could do it, I think, or I should be able to statements. They are can-do statements, meaning I can do these. I have some kind of evidence around these. And you can imagine from an employer's point of view or from a, a university um, course programming perspective how a grid like this can be helpful in helping to direct people in the best way possible towards a particular job, towards a particular class, for example. Some of the advantages to using the CEFR, which I think you've probably noticed already, uh, it provides a common basis for describing and measuring language proficiency, so it's a coherent document. It also provides a common framework that can be understood by all users, so it's very transparent. Even if you are a younger learner, um, working with younger learners, we've had good luck with them being able to understand it. It's certainly the more basic levels of the CEFR and people at different various language proficiencies. Are there, if there's any questions um, about the CEFR specifically before I move on to the European language portfolio, please feel free to ask them now. Put up your hand if you have a specific question about the CEFR, and I'd be happy to answer that. Um, if not, I will move along. Okay, I'll move along, but you feel free to put up your hand anytime you have a question. I'm going to talk next about the European Language Portfolio, or the ELP. Miriam, did you have a question? So, um, yeah, um, this is available. Is there like a test that people do, or how is it actually carried out, the CE, the CEFR? Yeah, if I understand your, correctly, your question correctly, you're asking about evaluation uh, in regards to people's language proficiency against the CEFR. Um, there are a number of different international measures that are used um, to help people get a validation for their level on the CEFR. Um, in French, for example, it's the DELF DELF. Um, in Spanish, it's the DELE. In German, it's the Sprachdiplom. Um, in uh, Chinese, the, the Chinese government has recently moved the HSK and YCT for young learners over to the um, CEFR grid. Uh, there's English exams through Cambridge that are correlated to CEFR. And Japan Foundation, my understanding is they're moving uh, to the CEFR for Japan Foundation testing, University of Lviv exam for Ukrainian, you get the picture. So there are large scale external measures that validate the level of CEFR, um, but I think that what you'll see is that the European Language Portfolio, or the ELP, is probably the most robust way to uh, provide information about where somebody is on the CEFR, or the way for them to be able to show um, and explore their own language proficiency. Those large scale measures are called international creden credentials. Um, and they are different depending on the different governments that uh, administer them, but they generally are a language credential that a student has or a learner has uh, to be able to use as a certification of their language level, and they would corroborate it with the ELP. And if you get a B2 level or C1 level on the Schrock Diplom in um, most of those international um, exams. B2 level, for example, in Delft Delft will get you university entrance in France. C1 level in the Sprach Diplom will get you university entrance into Germany as well as, I believe, tuition support and resource support. So that's, you know, there's, there's some currency that's really connected to, uh, uh, connected to these recognitions with the credentialing. I hope that answers your question, Miriam. Um, yeah, so just one more question on that. How is a student, let's say I have a student interested in doing the DELF, and I don't think they have it in Red Deer yet, where can they go? Do they go see you or where? 
Well, what anybody would have to do who wanted to take uh, the DELF-DELF, for example, is they would have to go to a DELF-DELF language testing center. And we are a DELF-DELF language testing center um, here in Edmonton Public Schools. And they're in a variety of places. And because the French government is quite um, particular about how those exams are administered, they are, only they are only administered certain times of the year, and they can only be administered by trained assessors. And we train assessors and we administer those exams. And we do them for, for externals as well as for our own students. Is there a cost? Yes, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. So why don't we have that uh, conversation? Send me an email um, after the session, and, and I can direct you in the right place. Let's talk about the European Language Portfolio, or the ELP. The ELP is a means of recording and reflecting on skills and experiences in different languages acquired in school or outside. And I just want to draw your attention to um, I just want to draw your attention to some words, some really key words and phrases on this slide. This is recording and reflecting. So the learner is, you know, the I can statements or the can do statements that are used in the CEFR are really um, indicative of metacognition, self-reflection. And we want that reflection to continue in the ELP. So this is the document that really brings the CEFR to life for individuals. Because as you can imagine, the CEFR was created for vocational and economic pur purposes. But of course, the educational community, the post-secondary community said, you know, we need to be able to use this. Um, but we need something that's a little more robust and a little more detailed than just this grid. And so that's why the European language portfolio was developed. And it is meant to provide a place for learners to reflect on their skills and experiences in all the different languages that they know, including their mother tongue, and everything, the experiences that they have in school and outside of school. Now, ELPs within the European Union are validated. So countries develop different ELPs for different for different age levels, for example. There'll be one for young children, one for teenagers, one for adults, one's for use in the workplace. Um, one country can have many different versions of an ELP. But in order to be validated, they must have these three components. They must have a passport, they must have a biography, and they must have a dossier. Okay, I'm going to present each one of these components. At the end of the presentation of each one of these little components, I'm going to ask if you have any questions about that particular component. So please just keep those questions in mind um, to be able to ask them when that time arrives. The first component is the passport. And the very best way that I can really think of uh, the passport to be described, the best analogy I can use is that it's like a snapshot. The passport section of the portfolio, the first section of the portfolio, provides an overview of the individual's language proficiency in different languages. So the exercise that we did a little earlier, where we talked about, you talked about, all of your different languages that you have some kind of competency in, and you described your level of language proficiency using the CEFR, that's kind of like what the passport does, but in a more formal uh, way. It presents an overview. Um, all of the proficiency levels that are defined in that passport are by the seat referenced by the CEFR. So you would be indicating I'm an A1 or an A2 or B1 or B2 in whatever languages, in whatever language skills. The passport is the most formal part of the document. Um, this is where you record all of your formal qualifications so that if you did take the DELF DELF and you achieved, let's say you took the A2 DELF DELF um, and you passed it you would put that, um, you would write that in your passport that you have this particular language credential. You, pardon me, you could include other formal qualifications that you uh, have, such as a course maybe that you took at university, or a course you completed in high school. Or perhaps you want to um, talk about some very significant experiences briefly in your passport. They're very brief descriptions, such as I went on an exchange, or I hosted an exchange student, or I participated in the Japan Day 
um, such as your students did, Miriam, at, at Isley, and I learned about Japanese culture. It would be whatever you think is important for other people to know about you as a language user and somebody who encounters um, cultural experiences. It tends to be a very small document. It looks like a little booklet. Um, Kendra, I think you've seen the one that Edmonton Public Schools developed, the little green booklets uh, that are the passports. And Miriam, I don't know if you've seen those, but you can see them next time you're in the building. <laughs> and they're, they're always like that. No matter where you go in the world, there are always these little, um, these little booklets that have information about in them that the user selects to be able to show who they are as a language learner and who they are in terms of the significant uh, intercultural ex language and intercultural experiences that they have had. And you would use this document to show employers, for example. You would use it to show your parents. You would use it to show um, instructors. Um, it can be used for articulation purposes from grade to grade, articulation purposes from school to school, and articulation purposes into the world of work. Increasingly, we see the passport moving into um, a digital format. Uh, there's something called the Europass, which you can see on the Council of Europe website, that a lot of people use for employment purposes. We are, in addition to our paper copies of the passport that we have here um, at EPS, we are currently developing a digital passport for our students to be able to use. Because as you can see here, um, on a passport, this is an example from Europe, uh, a photo I took of a classroom I visited uh, within the European Union. And as you can see, this student is studying English uh, at a beginner level. They have just started studying English. And they have shaded themselves in at an A1 level. Now, a person would be able to shade in just part of a level, for example. If you felt I, I've accomplished an A1 level, and I've got about half of an A2 level, you could do that in your passport. Usually, if you shade in an entire level, it means that you've actually accomplished that level and that you are now operating within the next level. And what we see here in this passport would be considered, you know, this would be consistent with um, somebody who was at a, at a beginner level um, in studying. And we can see it's English in this particular case where this student has uh, has started studying English. Now I invite your questions for the passport component. Please feel free to use your mic. You seem very comfortable using the mic, so that's great. If you also wanted to type it in here on the slide, uh, you can feel free to do that as well. Do you have any questions about the passport? Marnie, I know you mentioned to me earlier that um, some groups are using this with junior highs or high schools, but that you didn't suggest using this with the elementary classes. Could you explain why or what you would do or, or how you could modify that for the younger grades, please? Um, it's not that I don't recommend um, that teachers use it at the elementary level. I think we have, we have actually have several teachers using it at the elementary level and are doing so quite successfully. I do think that um, at the, the, the actual document that we have seems to be um, more consistent with what you see for secondary, geared for secondary students across the European Union. And you seem to see more modified passports for use um, in the, for the elementary grades. That being said, anybody can use it who wants to. It just means that that teacher really has to support uh, the student's use of that passport to really help them understand you know, what these CEFR levels are, for example. I think some of the higher levels in the CEFR, more advanced levels in the CEFR, are more difficult for younger students to understand. So it's just a matter of doing it in such a way that is um, appropriate for their cognitive level, appropriate, appropriate for their age. Uh, my colleague Norman Zivica and I just went out to, we were at Dover Court School, and we actually uh, began an implementation of passports with students in the Mandarin bilingual program. And these were students in grades five and six, and a few even in grade four. <laughs> and we just, we, we did it really, really carefully. So we, we only implemented um, having the students go through a very guided reflection process 
primarily about levels A1 and A2. Uh, that's what we stuck to because if you look at the CEFR, if you start looking at, for instance, B2 level, starting at the B levels, you're getting into adult context. You're getting into communicative context that we would consider adult context. So it's not realistic to assume ever that a, that a 10 year old would be operating at a B2 level, even if it is their, um, you know, even if it is their language of origin and even if they are quite verbal, the actual context for communication tend to be more adult. So it's not that I wouldn't recommend it, it's just that what I do recommend is that there's a great deal of support. That being said, I think that should also be a really supported implementation for secondary students as well. If there's no other questions about the passport component, I will move on. But if you have any other questions, I'm certainly happy to answer those. Have you both seen, you've both seen examples of the passport, I think. You've, you've both seen uh, what that passport looks like. So you, I think you both have a concept of, of what I'm talking about when we're talking about the passports. Okay. Well, let's move on then. So the first component is the passport, which is like a snapshot. It provides an overview for the learner to show who they are as a language learner. It's really the only piece of the entire ELP that we would consider summative. And the reason we would consider it, you know, from an assessment perspective, the reason we would consider it summative is it provides an overview and it is meant to be shared with those outside the classroom. That's really who they're preparing that passport for. The passport's not so much for themselves. The passport is for other people. What is for themselves is the biography. This is really the learner, uh, you know, a really learner-centered piece. Because the biography, if the passport is the snapshot, the biography is really like the workbook. And the biography allows the learner to plan and reflect upon and assess his or her progress in language learning. It encourages the learner to state what he or she can do in each language and to include information on linguistic and cultural experiences gained in and outside formal educational context. So it's kind of like you're taking what you described really briefly in the passport and very often you're expanding on it in the biography. The biography um, tends to look like kind of like worksheet kind of materials. Um, they, it encourages students to set goals for themselves in building their language proficiency and it's really about the process of learning a language. The passport is here's the result so far, but the biography is here is me in the process of learning this language. Here's a, an example of a, a simple biography page, uh, again from the European Union, a student in the European Union, and these are really, really common to see. This is a validated ELP, so a validated ELP means that you, you kind of uh, you buy them in bookstores, you buy them from publishers, they're published, and they come with a set number of pages um, that the students use, or the learner uses rather, because they may not be students. And in most of them, there's these checklists. So the checklist, as you can see, has the A1, A2, B1, B2, C1 levels. Okay, this one seems to go C1, 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 C seems to be glommed together here. And the student writes in, or the learner writes in their different languages and indicates, she starts checking off um, the statements that are all related to the CEFR and where, where they think they are. This is the simplest type of biography sheet. We also see lots of other biography sheets that will take, for instance, there'll be a whole A1 uh, portfolio where the biography takes the A1 level and breaks it down into little can-do statements that are at uh, a cognitive level appropriate for whatever age group is using that. Students would take, for example, something else you could do, teachers do with a biography, is you take one of these can-do statements that these students have indicated they can do and you use that as the beginning of some goal setting statements. So you have the students perhaps write a little piece or um, describe a piece orally about what it is they want to work on and improve on that they see in their can-do checklist. We see all kinds of things in the biography component. Um, it 
most teachers end up liking to personalize their biography components. Uh, we tend to, here at Edmonton Public Schools, we have, because we don't have any kind of Canadian uh, language portfolio that's been validated, uh, we seem to have a group of people who like to create all their own materials. We have a group of materials that we've just we've adapted from, for use from the European context and our teachers tend to use those and, and then also create their own and of course some of them are actually student created. So the biography component is quite a, a large component actually <laughs> and we talked about it very briefly so you may have some questions about this particular component and please feel free to ask those now. Marnie, would this potentially tie in with our ICANN statements from the curriculum if you can line, align them, I guess, with the A1, A2, or B1 level depending on what grade you're teaching? Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. And the, where, the curriculum can be, um, where the curriculum can be addressed or aligned, I guess, into the ELP would in fact be in the biography component. What you want to be able to do, what we try and do with our CANDU statements, we develop CANDU statements, for example, centrally for our bilingual programs and our French immersion programs, and, and we are doing that for our FSL programs as well, Kendra, so you can watch for those. <laughs> um, what we want to make sure is that the ICANN statements um, that are developed and used and included in the ELP also follow the philosophy of the ELP. So that would mean, for example, that they, they don't deal with language in discrete points. Those ICANN statements that would be included in the biography to align with CEFR would need to be um, reflecting that part of the curriculum that's most communicative, that's task-based. So in the case of FSL, for example, um, you would be using a can-do statements, for example, that relate to uh, the communicative targets that are in your program articulation document. Those would probably align quite nicely uh, in an ELP because you want to be carrying through that spirit of the CEFR that you see begun in, in the passport. Uh, in the case of the Japanese language and culture program of studies, you would probably be using mostly, reflecting mostly ICANN statements uh, from the applications portion of your program of studies because that's where you see the language proficiency in action. I can statements such as, you know, I can conjugate a verb or something like that are of, I think, well, they're, they're probably of limited use. Um, they can be included, of course, but they really don't give you any information about language proficiency. The CEFR talks about what people can do with a language. So that's the kind of ICANN statements I think you want to reflect in those, in the biography. But yes, absolutely, the can-do statements that, that we use for curriculum, uh, those are part of the biography component. And just to clarify, you're working on something district-wide for FSL that if I didn't get around to creating my own this year, you would have eventually. <laughs> I'm I'm putting up my laughing face because it's in my work plan <laughs> for this year, and I I know that we have to start working on that. We've had plans to to work on that. So yes, you've given me the inspiration that we do indeed have to go back and get that done. I actually think it's not uh, a terribly well, I say this, I don't think it's a terribly complicated job. I think it's around those communicative targets and it's a matter of making them. Um, any kind of can-do statement that's created around curriculum is in the language that is most, that is in a, in a level of language that's comprehensible to the student because some outcomes are, are kind of, um, are kind of difficult. But yes, Kendra, the answer is yes. The sample you gave was in the native language. I mean, not native, like in the second or third language. Is that what the can-do statements are and that the language that they're learning? That is also an excellent question. Um, very often we hear what language should the uh, learner be using to, um, to access these biography materials? What language should they be using for doing these checklists, for using CANDU statements? And my answer to that is, is always, well, it depends. Um, you have a couple of schools of thought on this particular issue. Um, some assessment experts, such as 
Black and Willow will say, listen, you can't have students using any kind of assessment information if they don't understand the assessment information. So that's an argument, for example, in a Japanese second language class at a high school that to have, OK, have those biography materials in English, have these can-do lists in English. Um, another colleague of mine from the UK, David Little, who works extensively in CEFR, says we will never achieve, uh, he says we will never achieve a true advancement in language proficiency until we have students engaging in metacognition, even if it's at a very, very simple level. So that's a case for um, trying to have students work with the materials in the target language. I think there's probably a continuum. I think that probably what you can do is use very simple, start off by using very simple can-do statements. Uh, in the target language, but the more complex kinds of biography materials needs to be in a language that, that they are able to negotiate their way through uh, with ease. Uh, we all want to move our students towards this great language proficiency. Of course, if you're working with a Japanese 10, 3Y class, their language proficiency is going to be so, so simple uh, that it may be only the very simplest can-do statements that you can play around with in your classroom. So I would say you have to try some different things. I think a, the, the rule of thumb with assessment is that it's, it should be consistent with your instruction. So whatever your philosophy is around how you do instruction, that should be pretty consistent with your assessment. That being said, if you're doing more complex kinds of biography materials with them, uh, with uh, a type of vote, you're using language that is very specific or technical, in certain kinds of inventories, language inventories, for example, you probably want to do it in the language the students can use. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions at this time for the biography session. So I'm just going to move on to the dossier. But again, if you want to be able to backtrack to biography, we can, we can do that too. So the um, passport was the snapshot. And the biography is the workbook. And the dossier then is actually the evidence. So this is where you prove what it is you're actually able to do in the language. So in the passport, I present an overview about myself. I present an overview about what my language proficiency levels are in, in different language skill areas and in different languages. And in uh, presenting information about my really important uh, cultural experiences that I have that I think are, that are, are significant for other people to know. And then in my biography, I'm goal setting, and I'm tracking my progress, and I'm, I'm exploring my language proficiency in different languages. And I'm setting goals for myself, and I'm talking about whether or not I was able to achieve those goals. And then in the dossier, I actually show what I can do. So the dossier actually most resembles, I think, what a lot of people here in Canada think a portfolio actually is. Uh, it's, it can be a collection of student work. It's exemplars of student work. It shows your best examples, for example. All of these things can be included in the dossier. The dossier offers the learner the opportunity to select materials to document or illustrate achievements or experiences that were recorded in the biography or the passport. So in essence, the whole ELP, all three components, are singing the same tune. So if I say, for example, OK, in Japanese, I'm in Japanese 20, and I'm, I'm very confident that I have accomplished an A1 level. And you can see reflected in my passport, I've got my English levels. And in my Japanese levels, I believe that I'm a solid A1 level. And then when you go to my biography, um, you see information in there about me reflecting on um, some more detail about the Japan Day that I participated in. I have some, some can-do checklists that I've checked off about what I can do in Japanese. I have some anecdotal information, for example. In the dossier, we should see some evidence about you, you at an A1 level using Japanese. Perhaps there is an excerpt of a text 
um, in Japanese in your in your dossier. Perhaps there's a copy of a postcard or an email that you were able to write. Perhaps there is um, an example of calligraphy. Perhaps you have uh, a cultural artifact or a picture of a cultural artifact that you were able to collect. Here's an example of a student dossier page that's actually paper-based. Um, and as you can see from the, there's a little mark at the bottom <laughs> that this was a summative piece that was included. And that's absolutely fine, too. You can include summative pieces in there. For whatever reason, the student felt that this was important to be able to include in their dossier. And that's kind of the key, is that the students think it's important for them to include in their dossier. So they select the work to go into the dossier. Now, when you look through a class set of dossier materials, sometimes you'll see things that are very consistent from student to student, where maybe the teacher has said, you know, this would be a really good item to include in your dossiers, everybody. And sometimes you see dossiers that are completely different from student to student. In the end, what it really should do is it should reflect uh, the student's language proficiency, and it should reflect their, their cultural and intercultural experiences. The dossier, the actual physical form of the dossier, can vary depending on the learner. It's all representations of cultural and language experiences. It could be digital. Uh, we have one high school that has said, you know, we collect so much information digitally through use in our language lab, for example, why aren't we turning this into dossier evidence because we're implementing ELP? Um, in younger grades, um, a shoebox or some kind of holder for, for a dossier seems to be popular. Um, also, some of the some of the you know things that you can get at like Staples or whatever, where they're kind of like these big envelopes, big plastic envelopes or file folders, things that can hold interesting objects. Um, oral and written samples can be included. Uh, really moving towards a lot in digital because so much can be captured digitally and stored on servers. All items in the dossier are chosen by the learner ideally, although we do know that teachers need to guide. Um, teachers need to be able to, to guide this process with students. It's really easy to let the dossier become really big and huge and just the collection of all their student work. What you really want students to do ideally with this section is select that work that really shows their language proficiency. And it's important for students to somehow be a part of that conversation so that they're thinking about their own language proficiency. Because ultimately, if they can select items that reflect their language proficiency, they're going to be better self-reflectors on something like the CEFR and the passport. You may want to just think to yourself, for an example, what, what items would you put in your dossier to represent? If you were the language learner and you have your own ELP, what would represent your language proficiency? What would represent your intercultural experiences? Would you print off an email um, that you received from someone that you were able to respond to? Um, would you write a description of a particular language interaction you had had? Would you include, uh, capture a link to a website of something in the target language that you use very frequently? Um, and something you talked about in your biography. Maybe there's a cultural artifact that you, you collected when you went on a trip somewhere that's meaningful to you. Uh, perhaps you have an oral sample. If you were participating in a, in a webinar like this in English, you're participating in, a, in something that was in the target language. Um, and you went to an event, for example, a francophone event at uh, Cité Francophone. You know, you went to a uh, you know, a theater show, would you include, you know, the billfold from the theater that shows the, the experience that you had and the level of language proficiency you were able to operate at, your work, your papers that you've written, all that kind of stuff can go in the dossier. As well, if you had actually done any language credentialing, if you had done the DELF DELF and you had a certification, frequently people put those certifications in, in their dossier. Uh, sometimes people put their PAT scores, or they wrote down that they, they wrote a PAT, a, perform, a provincial achievement exam en français in French language arts. Maybe they put the printout of their score in the dossier. At this time, I invite you to use your mic. 
or use the chat box to share any questions um, that you might have about the dossier component or any other components. Marnie, just an idea that popped up. Do you know of any schools that are that have their second language teachers working in conjunction with their English language arts teachers to say, kind of do this project and say, okay, in, in your LA class you may be at a B1, B2, and here's examples in their LA portfolio, and in their second language they're working at say an A1 or A2, and here's examples of that. That is really our hope, Kendra, to move schools towards a whole school approach in using uh, the ELP and to think about it in terms of all of the language areas. We've had a lot of interest from schools when we come in to do information sessions. We have a lot of interest from schools um, in the various departments. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of that kind of collaboration that you have to trigger to be able to make that work. We feel like we're really moving towards that. Um, at this time, it still seems to be, overall, it still seems to be in the domain of the second language teachers. Uh, but we really encourage, we really encourage that kind of cross-collaboration. And if your school wants to pilot that kind of project, that would be fantastic because that's really what we want to move towards. We really, we really think that when we talk about 21st century literacies, when we talk about um, high school completion, we feel it's absolutely critical for kids to be engaged in meaningful metacognition around what they can do in language, not in just the language of their study, but the language of origin, the language of their neighborhood, the language that they're also using in their um, languages that they're also you know, learning in school in terms of their ELA classes. We think all of that is really, really critical. I don't have a question, but just a comment. I think it's a really good way to make your kids identify with the second language as well. If they're, it's like a portfolio, right? And then they can be proud of that work and have something to show people what they can achieve in that second language. So I might try that. We saw some really inspiring examples. We went to um, Spain, and one of the things we looked at was, was visited some classrooms that were implementing ELP, because of course they have validated portfolios. And we talked to some students who had some proficiency in English, and, and they were students at the junior high level, and they shared um, that they frequently take these portfolios home to show their parents because to their parents this, this world of learning English was, is, is different for them. Uh, they hadn't experienced this type of thing when they went to school, so they were able to describe and show their parents their language proficiency levels. Um, that they, one student said, and this was really, really interesting from an assessment perspective, I think it's really powerful. The student said, I understand now that it's my job to do the work, to increase, to get better at languages, and it's my teacher's job to help me, but I also have to tell the teacher what I need. And it was actually the, the mechanism of using the checklist, of using the biography section, and gathering that kind of information through the dossier that brought the student to that realization about his own learning, which is amazing to hear from, from a student be able to articulate that. The fact that he could articulate it in a language that was not his own, his own mother tongue was, was even more amazing. But from an assessment perspective, we thought that was really powerful. Well, I will just um, move on then. If you have any questions, please just raise your hand, and I will stop and address those questions. So you've learned about the three components um, of the ELP. Well, first of all, you learned about the CEFR, which is the foundational document. It is the framework of reference for all languages. And we learned how that CEFR can come to life in the educational context, also in the vocational context through the passport, which is that summative piece, the snapshot or the overview of the language learner. The biography piece, which is really where we see the learning with our own eyes. We see the goal setting. We see the progress tracking. And then the dossier, where we get to see the results of all that learning. We get to see the evidence of that learning or the, the 
um, the work that the students have actually produced. Now I want to think about where, so where are we going with all of this in Canada? Um, well, the answer to that is we're going a lot of places and it seems like we're, we're going faster and faster with every year. When we first started talking about CEFR and ELP here at Edmonton Public Schools about six years ago, um, it was just coming on to the scene. It was just, we were just building an awareness about it in Canada and we were the only place, I think, in Canada that was really, um, that was really launching any kind of pilot work with it. We have since seen things move much faster in Canada and we've seen them move throughout Canada. Uh, the slide that I have up there right now is quite text dense, so I just invite you to, to read that through. This is from the CMEC, which is the Council of Ministers of Education in Canada. And the Council of Ministers in Education in Canada have endorsed the CEFR for adoption for use in Canada and have recommended that it occupy a central place in Canada as a reference tool to support language learning. Throughout the European Union we see that the CEFR is used as the basis for developing resources. Uh, it's used as a basis for curriculum development. It's used as a basis for creating assessment tools. So it is, it is the go-to document for language teaching and learning um, across the European Union. And it is starting to pick up steam here in Canada. So the CMEC document is, is part of that picture. We really see the spreading of international credentialing uh, throughout Canada. We were the first school district to start using measures such as um, the DELF-DELF and the Schrock Diplom and, and the HSK and YCT for young learners at the school district level. And since then we've just seen it explode, particularly with DELF-DELF. There are now many DELF-DELF testing centers across Canada and there are you know thousands of students getting these international credentials across Canada uh, for use both inside and outside of Canada. And as it continues to be endorsed across Canada and used as a measure across Canada, that will only increase. Universities are starting to calibrate their course offerings to CEFR. Um, the latest university that I know of is the University of Ottawa is calibrating all of their course language course offerings to CEFR. County Saint-Jean here in Edmonton is um, is moving to that as well. Um, I took a, an adult course from them in the summer and they already use CEFR for all of their uh, for all of their non-credited courses and language courses and I know U of A is moving towards that as well because we've been talking to them about that. So we're going to see, the, the implication for that as educators is that this is what our kids are going to need to know. When they leave us, when they leave our level of education, they go into, if they go into post-secondary education, and they take any kind of language offering, um, and maybe this will also spread to all kinds of English language offering as well, they will need to know what their CEFR levels are. They have to have some kind of familiarity. So it's part of when we talk about, you know, the leave-taking skills that we want students to have when they leave our school districts. And we talk about 21st century literacies. This is really part of that big picture. And it's equipping them with something very concrete, a piece of knowledge that's very concrete. Schools and jurisdictions are going ahead and creating all their own versions of ELPs. Um, generally, we see things being created mostly on an ad hoc basis. I get lots of calls and, and emails from people um, working across the country asking, you know, can we see what you've done and can I talk to you about what you've done? And so there's this information sharing. But at the end of the day, everybody has a little bit of their own um, they have their own agendas and they have their own languages that you're, they're offering in their school district. But we do see that curricula, for example, it's not here on the slide, but curriculum is really where we're starting to see a lot of movement with CEFR in Canada. Uh, the BC language curricula is now correlated to CEFR really strongly. Like if you look at it, it says A1, A2, B1, B2, Ontario has correlated its curricula to CEFR and I believe that that's the direction that the territories are going as well. So as curriculum comes under review and gets renewed in the various provinces, including Atlantic provinces as well, I believe, are, are doing that. I know they're doing a lot of work with ELP now. 
um, as all of these curricula across Canada come under review, they're all aligning to CEFR, which is really interesting because in the past, every province and every territory, um, education is under the, the jurisdiction of the provinces, was different. And now we're starting to see this, um, maybe not a common curricula across provinces, but we're seeing this one reference point in the different provinces. Uh, by using the CEFR, so it's really, it's quite, it's quite exciting. Please go ahead, Kendra. Um, is this w then where Alberta's going to go whenever we do get a new curriculum? Is that the direction that the province is planning on taking us as well? Or I guess whoever's on the board? In terms of Alberta, what I can tell you is that we already have curricula that's, that's aligned with CEFR. Um, all of the language and culture curricula that was created for all the languages other than uh, French, uh, so the curricula that Miriam is using, for example, were when they were developed, the CEFR was in draft, and it was used to inform very strongly the development of that curriculum. So uh, when Miriam is using the um, when Miriam's using the applications, for example, she's going to notice that the applications outcomes, which are the driver outcomes for her program of studies, very clearly, are aligned to the kinds of functions and tasks you see in the CEFR. For French as a second language, uh, the program articulation document and the communicative functions you see in the program articulation document are aligned to uh, the CEFR. The FIM program, the French Immersion program, and the Bilingual Language Arts Program of Studies weren't created when the CEFR was around. Um, it's very much on the, I can tell you that it's very much on the radar screen at the ministry. Currently the only program of studies I know of that's under any kind of even initial redrafting is the French Language Arts Program of Studies. And I'm not involved in that, so I'm not exactly sure where they're going. I can't imagine that programs of studies that are being created now in Canada wouldn't be referencing the CEFR. It's just, it's the direction that the entire country uh, is moving in. So the answer to your question is, I think probably as curriculum comes under review, uh, it will be aligning with CEFR. But the answer is also that we already do have uh, curricular documents that are aligned to CEFR in Alberta. Yes, please. And that's my, my last slide has my, um, has my contact information there. And I'm, um, I'm not the only person who is working in the area of CEFR and assessment, but my principal area, of course, that I work in is assessment. So I have, um, I probably your, your, one of your information sources to be able to use um, for this topic. And please feel free to, call or email if you have any questions about the European language portfolio or the common European framework of reference and how it can be used in the second language classroom. I thank you for your time. Um, thank you for staying late. It's dark outside already <laughs> to be able to learn more about this topic. I think it's really fascinating and I believe that this is absolutely the future direction for teaching and learning in languages. Um, and you're now part of a large cohort of teachers um, that have more information and have a knowledge and awareness of the Common European Framework of Reference and ELP. And should you be interested in joining the ranks of teachers who are implementing um, these documents, you know, please, uh, please do so. It's, it's quite a rich language learning experience. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to entertain those now. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks very much. And when you exit the room, you will have uh, a survey, I guess, a prompt to be able to fill out a survey. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>